Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome. We're, we're, we're delighted to have you. Uh, thank you very much for coming. My name is John Hamry, and uh, very pleased to have you here for our second uh, Asia Pacific Forecast Conference. I'm sorry, I'm a little groggy. I was up most of the night rereading the President's speech trying to find that pivot part. <laughs> Didn't uh, quite get that. Uh, so we decided instead we would hold a little conference here uh, uh, on looking at the Asia Pacific. Uh, it's hard to think of um, a more dynamic place in the world right now. Uh, matter of fact, there is no more dynamic place in the world right now than Asia. So many confluences. I was uh, in Tokyo last week. And uh, and just amazed at the depth and vibrancy of debate, uh, which is exciting. It's very interesting. It's far more, uh, far more engaged than we are in Washington. So we thought we need to do something. And of course, uh, Mike Green and the Asia team here has uh, has has our strongest our strongest cadre. And we wanted to show that off a little bit and to engage with all of you in how we're looking at this region and the challenges that are in front of us. Uh, I do want to welcome Rick Rossow. Rick is our new uh, Wadwani Chair uh, for Asia and, Southeast, and South Asia Studies. And Rick, we're glad to have you here. I hope you do good today. I, we, you know, this is his first outing. And I'm going to keep track of that. I want to make sure. <laughs> I'm sure he'll be OK, you know. Uh, you know, I want to say special thanks to Fred Hyatt and, uh, and to, uh, um, uh, and Fred's here, I know. Is Mr. Bussey here? Is John, John here? I haven't seen him yet. But Fred, I'm very grateful that you would, you could do both. Yeah, well, you do more. <laughs> I think that's probably right. I'd like to say welcome to Ambassador Sasai, Mirpuri, and Kong, who, who are joining us here today as well. And we'll uh, hopefully add some of their perspective and insight through the day. Uh, as a reward for you all coming, you're going to do a little bit of work. And that's what that little white clicker thing is in front. We're going to ask you to, to vote on a few things. I do want to give you a word of warning that there is a very small explosive charge in it, and it'll go off if you leave with it with, out through side the room, OK? So leave it on the table when you're done. I don't want anybody to get blown up. Um, that's just a joke. I mean, it's just a joke, but just please leave them when you're done. So, Mike, why don't we turn it over to you? Let's get this started for real. Thank you all for coming. We're delighted to have you here. Mike, why don't you come on? Here. So, um, thank you. Uh, thanks for coming out in the snow. It wasn't much snow, but we appreciate um, any Washingtonian uh, stepping out in even a centimeter of snow. We started this last year as an Asia forecasting conference. Um, last year, our staff recommended we call it the annual Asia Palooza, which uh, was fun, but um, we, we thought we needed to be a little bit more serious in tone. And the point uh, was to try to get uh, a sense of what events uh, we should be watching over the coming year. This is useful for us inside uh, CSIS as we pool our resources and look at cross-cutting themes uh, across the region. Uh, think about programming events, research projects, um, and we thought it would be uh, interesting um, and helpful to you and to us to uh, unveil some of our thinking about what's coming up and uh, include you in the process. We're going to uh, take our A team on Asia uh, and put them up against two of the leading journalists uh, on American foreign policy uh, and economic policy, uh, and also all of you. So in the first panel, um, we will focus on leadership and security. Um, the panel will be moderated by Fred Hyatt, the editorial page editor of the Washington Post, um, an old Asia hand. Uh, Fred was um, living the life of luxury as the Washington Post bureau chief in Tokyo when I was a poor, starving graduate student at the same time, eating instant ramen, um, and has had a steady eye on Asia ever since. Um, I actually remember very well when he uh, began writing uh, the editorials for the Washington Post on Asia in 1996. And I think it's the most consistent, um, balanced, um, and, uh, and strategic uh, take on what's happening in the region that, that, that you can find. I, I, I read it every, every, uh, every time there's something on Asia in particular. Um, he'll be uh, joined by Ernie Bauer, our senior advisor and Sumitro chair for Southeast Asian Studies, uh, Victor Cha, senior advisor and Korea chair uh, here at CSIS, and Chris Johnson, our uh, senior advisor and Freeman Chair in China Studies to look at leadership 
uh, and security issues across the region. Um, in the second panel, uh, John Bussey, who's coming down from New York, um, I hope he's not going through what I went through. I came down from an event in New York uh, and got in at 3 a.m. this morning. Uh, Amtrak is struggling, but hopefully he'll, uh, he'll be here in time. And uh, John, uh, as many of you know, is the assistant managing editor and executive business editor for the Wall Street Journal. Also, someone who writes columns on international economic policy and especially economic developments in Asia uh, that, that is consistently spot on. And John's also an old Asia hand, having spent time in Hong Kong as a loose fellow early in his career. And on that panel, I will have Matt Goodman, the uh, Simon Chair in Political Economy here, Scott Miller, uh, Senior Advisor and Skoll Chair in International Business, and our newest edition, uh, which we're delighted um, uh, to have uh, Rick Rossau, the Wadwani Chair in U.S.-India Policy Studies. This is his first event. He'll have to step out to be suited for his chicken outfit um, and practice his number, but we're really looking forward to, uh, to Rick's debut. And then over lunch, I'm going to um, lead a panel discussion with three of the most distinguished ambassadors in this town. Um, Kenichiro Sasai, the ambassador of Japan to the United States. Ashok Mirpuri, the ambassador from Singapore, and Yen Kwa Kwang, the ambassador from Vietnam. Um, when, uh, uh, when the panels um, uh, are up here, um, we are going to uh, uh, ask you also to uh, make predictions, um, either to correct what the panelists say or to prompt some discussion. And uh, Fred and John will ask you at several points throughout the panel discussion to use your clickers. Um, I don't have one, but you should all have a clicker in front of you. Um, if you've been here before, you've, you've, you've used these. Um, we'll ask a question about uh, developments in the region, expectations over the coming year. You get to click. Um, I think the, I'm looking for my tickets. You can click multiple times. Uh, you can switch, but you only get one vote. So it's kind of like musical chairs. If you're clicking wildly, whenever he stops it, that's your vote. So you can change your mind, but you don't want to meander for too long. But you only get one vote. So uh, uh, if you feel very, very strongly that there will be a war in Asia, you're not allowed to just click, 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 click to try to drive up the vote. You'll see the vote moving, but that's not how, that's not how it works. Um, and uh, to get started and test our thumb muscles a little bit on the clickers, I have three broad questions I want to ask, just so we can practice, um, about the uh, region and about U.S. relations with the region. So um, the first question is a yes and no question. We're starting easy. Um, we like to ask audiences about the rebalance, the so-called pivot to Asia. Every time we ask it, uh, the general answer is, uh, the most common answer is, it's the right idea. It's not being fully implemented. So we thought we'd ask a much simpler binary yes or no question, which is this one. Is the United States living up to the expectations of the rebalance to Asia? So you can vote now, uh, yes or no. Yours. <laughs> or whoever you, you, you choose to represent in your clicking. OK. Um, so the president and the White House have some work to do. The president's going to the region in April, um, Japan, uh, Philippines, Malaysia, uh, we hope Korea. The itinerary hasn't been set, but uh, it's an important uh, visit. And maybe uh, afterwards when we do this, uh, those results will reverse. Or maybe not. We'll see. Um, second question. Uh, how concerned are you about the potential for military conflict in Asia, in this region, uh, in this uh, year, in 2014? A, extremely concerned. B, somewhat concerned. C, neither. D, not concerned at all, or E, don't know? That's a, that's a high number. <laughs> am, uh, am I getting that right? B, somewhat concerned about uh, the potential for military conflict. Um, now, granted, we are the Center for Strategic and International Studies, and uh, uh, there may be selection bias in the audience, but, um, but I can tell you, I recently spoke at a Goldman Sachs investors conference where the audience was almost entirely hedge fund managers, um, large uh, investors of pension funds and so forth. And they, asked a, they had clickers. Um, they asked a question like this, do you think there will be a conflict between Japan and China this year? And uh, over a third said yes. Um, and, uh, and then I did the things you do at these conferences where you meet with the investors afterward. And the in big institutional investors wanted to know how could they hedge, and the hedge fund managers wanted to know how to position themselves to make more money if there's a war. <laughs> um, so 
not just because of the comments by Prime Minister Abe and Chinese leaders in Davos, but in general, this is, uh, this is a big concern this year. We'll talk about this on the next panel, and Fred will sort it out for us. And the last question uh, on broad trends on the economy, which of the following best describes your expectations for regional economic growth this year? Significant growth, A, B, limited growth, C, no change, D, limited decline, and E, significant decline. Limited, so limited growth. So the, the, the summation of the forecast from the audience is uh, rebalance not up to expectations, were possible, but moderate returns on investment. <laughs> um, this is just to sort of get your clicking thumbs ready. We're going to dive deeper into all of these questions, the President's trip, security and leadership trends in the economy. And to get us started, if I could ask Fred and uh, Ernie, Chris, and Victor to come to the stage. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Mike, uh, for the nice introduction. Thanks for having me. Good morning, everybody. Um, last year when we did this, as I recall, we were at some slum over on K Street, and uh, <laughs> so <laughs> this is very elegant, and uh, congratulations to CSIS on this beautiful new building. Um, my memory of uh, my time in Tokyo is not quite the same. I was paid in dollars, and uh, we felt like we were poor students from a third world country. We'd go by the store, look at the apples, and wish we could afford one for our children, you know. But um, <clears throat> The computers or the fruit? <laughs> this is fruit, nicely wrapped fruit. Um, so uh, we have great experts here, but why don't we start out with, uh, just to keep you guys warmed up and in the game, with the first real question, uh, which is, um, can we get it? I don't know who I'm talking to here. Uh, there we go. Xi Jinping's control of domestic politics this year will increase, remain the same, decrease, don't know. Um, your answers do not get reported to the Chinese, so, uh, <laughs> or the NSA. This is purely anonymous. <clears throat> Wow, so um, I guess we can say the audience thinks that what's been happening will continue to happen, only more so. Um, which one would you have checked, Chris? Well, I, I, I did check the same one, increase. <laughs> um, Why? <laughs> well, yeah, what's going on? And, yeah, and, uh, um, well, several things. I mean, I think the thing I would highlight is it's clear now, especially after last fall's third plenum, uh, that Xi Jinping has consolidated power more quickly, much more quickly than I think most people would have expected. Um, I myself have always been an optimist uh, about him, but I have to say that he's, uh, he's moved even more quickly than, than I would have thought. Um, as, a, as a longtime watcher and analyst, uh, in many ways I love this guy because he's, uh, he's demonstrating that while there has, of course, been institutionalization within the system and so on, it's still China and it's still Chinese politics. And he's taking a very traditional approach to, to running the party and all the other key institutions. And so what is the explanation for why he's been able to consolidate power so quickly? I, I think there's three main factors. The first is that uh, his status as one of these princelings, the children of the uh, founders of the regime, Ha, you know, sort of sets him up with a what I would call a DNA map, if you will, of how that system runs. He has a very unique sense uh, of what, where the key levers of power are, how to manipulate those to his advantage. Um, as a Chinese friend put it to me some months ago, imagine what it was like for him as a young boy sitting around the dinner table every evening listening to his father tell these stories about how Mao Zedong was 
you know, uh, beating the heck out of his various enemies. You know, it, it gave him a, a, a sense of how the place runs. And I think that's really the second point, is that unlike his predecessor, Hu Jintao, and, and in fairness to Hu, I think it was not that he didn't understand this concept, it was that others prevented him from, from realizing the concept. But Xi Jinping clearly embraces uh, this sort of core organizing principle of the regime, which is that it, if you do not control the key levers of power, you will not wield any authority inside the system. So we see him grabbing hold of all of them very quickly, uh, the military, the security services, party bureaucracy. Uh, and then the third element, I think, is what we're seeing in the uh, strange mix of economic liberal talk and reform talk and political retrenchment, serious political retrenchment. And the toolkit there is pretty much anti-corruption, which of course uh, is and will continue, I think, this year to be uh, huge. Um, party rectification efforts to use their um, their terminology, even though it's, uh, and it's easy for us to, you know, see things like the mass line education campaign and, and kind of laugh, you know, because they're jargony and so on. This is very serious inside their system. And then this ideological retrenchment, uh, it's a very chilly period uh, right now for internet freedom, for just discussion, frankly, of ideas in general. And I think that's because the party knows they're going to undertake these very wrenching economic changes, and as such, they want to have really tight control on the politics. <clears throat> Let me um, push on that last one. Uh, I think there's two schools of thought, or at least one that, well, if you're going to do economic reform, you need these tight levers, and so let's get the constitutional lawyers under control and so forth. The other would be you can't have economic reform without political reform. The kinds of reform he wants depend on rule of law and uh, innovation and openness, and so uh, these things are contradictory and doomed. Um, what, how, what do you think? Well, I think there's a middle road uh, uh, of those two schools. I mean, I agree fundamentally with uh, the, 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 the second one, but let's not forget they've been doing it the other way for 30 years and have been doing so fairly successfully. Um, I, the only way, I, I've been grappling with this since Xi Jinping came to power and started demonstrating this odd, uh, seemingly contradictory approach, and I think the only way to really understand it is to get inside his head, you know, and see how he sees the problem, because I think for Western eyes it just doesn't make sense. And if you look at, if you understand the fundamental reason why he's there is because those who matter in the system have judged that he is most likely to preserve the party's leading role in the country. That's job number one. Not improving the economy, not, you know, rising China, it's keeping the party in power. So they've judged that he's the best, most capable person for doing that. And then I think if you take as, that as your organizing principle, and then you say to yourself, okay, what, what do you do next? Well, you look for threats, right, that will challenge that control. And so an economic model that clearly has run out of gas is a threat to the party's continued control. Uh, this, the social contract has changed dramatically. It's not about ideological stuff or communist belief or any of this anymore. It's the delivery of economic goods. And so you then, to fix it, you do these reforms. On the political side, however, uh, the challenge is different. It's how do we control, how do we continue to use this, let's face it, stovepiped Leninist system that we have, riding atop a very dynamic society while we're pursuing wrenching reforms? I mean, that's a recipe for, for disaster. So I think they feel that they have to have that tight political control. Does it make sense and is it going to work? I think that's a whole separate series of questions, but it doesn't mean that they don't believe it. And I think you have to take it at face value then uh, at that stage. I was uh, there a few months ago and was struck that it seemed a lot of people in the elite uh, were dubious about whether it would work. You know, I expected this was, I went right after the U.S. shut down and I expected a lot of, well, you guys are finished and we're number one. And, and a little to my surprise, I found, you know, a fair amount of you guys are finished or why can't you get your act together or whatever. Uh, not dissimilar from what a lot of us were saying, uh, <clears throat> but uh, not so much uh, self-confidence that they were inevitably going to assume number one. And, and, and a lot of it seemed to be people feeling as though we need to get to the next stage of the economy. We need more economics, but we don't trust that the leadership will have the confidence to do that. Um, I, do you think that's a widespread view, or and and do you think 
once he consolidates, he'll be able to open mm -hmm. a little bit more, or, yeah. or that's now off the table? Well, a couple things there. I mean, I think uh, first and foremost that that declinist meme, you know, it's still there, but it is much quieter. And I detect, I think there was a very fundamental shift. You know, we had the period after the global financial crisis where, you know, the hubris stuff was pretty, pretty high and, and riding high. I think in the last year, especially, uh, as the economy has slowed and the gears have been grinding and their traditional solutions have not been working and as they stare down the barrel of these very challenging things that they're trying to take on. I mean, this is the most dramatic reform proposals in several decades and this is all the stuff that Deng Xiaoping didn't bother to do, you know. <laughs> they have to look at the hard stuff now. Deng did all the easy things. So my sense is then that staring down that barrel, they're, they're becoming more uh, concerned about how is this going to go smoothly and so on. So I don't think you see that dichotomy so strongly. And frankly, that is a huge opportunity for the United States uh, to be thinking about how we can reassure them uh, on the one hand that we want them to succeed with these economic reforms. That's critical. I mean, all of us lose if, if this project goes uh, south. And two, though, to indicate to them where we can that in areas where we need their help, um, we would like to, you know, uh, press them more. And I think they're willing to talk uh, about these things. And then thirdly, we should be using things like bilateral investment treaty negotiations, uh, more openness on the Chinese side about TPP, uh, to shape the outcome of that reform trajectory. Because internally, there's a kind of end state, and it's not privatization, <laughs> and it's not what we may necessarily want to see. And so we should be using our influence through those negotiations, I think, to be able to help shape that outcome. That's very, very important. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> I think we'll come back to the question of U.S. policy. But why don't we go on to question number two, which might give us a chance to involve the rest of our panel. Uh, Chinese foreign policy will be marked by increased assertiveness, a charm offensive, both, neither. <laughs> Um, all right, well, if you put A and C together, I guess we've got about 98% for at least increased assertiveness, with or without charm. <laughs> uh, so let me, before I come to Chris and ask whether that's right or not, ask our other panelists whether that's what you the people you talk to are sensing. Uh, I think in Southeast Asia, uh, Fred, um, there was a real question before she uh, about what do the Chinese want? You know, uh, how are they going to use their new economic power? And I think um, a lot of those questions were answered in a, in a sort of negative way uh, when the Chinese drew the uh, nine dash line around the South China Sea in 2009, and it, it became clear uh, after that st step forward that China was going to use its economic <coughs> power to, um, to expand its, its regional power and to, to push its own sovereignty uh, issues uh, in the region. And when she came in, I think there was, a, there obviously was a, an opportunity to question, you know, will we have more clarity about who China is and what does China want? And I think, um, and now we're, the, the layers are starting to, to peel back. You know, are we, are we seeing that? And I think, based on what Chris said before, I think the Southeast Asians see a stronger leader in China, uh, one who is um, trying to get the Chinese economy in order. I think what Southeast Asians want is, is two things. They want China to be, feel secure, uh, and they want them to be economically successful. On the other hand, they do not want China to use um, that economic security uh, to, um, to continue to push its own uh, uh, objectives. In, in fact, uh, they don't want to see uh, Monroe Doctrine uh, sort of uh, rolled out in, in Southeast Asia. Victor, what are you seeing? Um, um, well, I, I said um, C as well. I think um, from um, Korea's perspective, there was uh, a real honeymoon initially in the Park Geun-hye Xi Jinping governments uh, through the first year of uh, both of their times in office, which, well, which pretty much overlapped. Um, there was a phrase that Lee um, myung bak the previous South Korean government, used to use for U.S.-Korea relations. They, say, they would say it's the best it's ever been. 
And um, you talk to people in the Pakane government last year, and they were using that same phrase about China. I think they really felt like even the previous government did not have a good relationship with China, both for political and strategic reasons. They wanted to change that, uh, obviously for economic reasons. But long term, you know, for Korea, the brass ring with China has always been, you know, Chinese attitudes, shaping Chinese attitudes on North Korean unification. So I think they felt like they made real progress in that vein in 2013. I think the, the message in 2014 is uh, a bit different, uh, in large part because of the ADIZ, China's declaration of the ADIZ, which, um, did, uh, which didn't overlap as much uh, as in the case of Japan, but certainly covered something that uh, Korea saw as there as this small uh, um, couple of rocks that had a weather station on it. And, um, what was not very well reported in the press, but happened was that the Koreans actually tried to cut their own deal on that first uh, to get the Chinese simply to revise that piece of it, which probably isn't good alliance politics. Um, um, and uh, the Chinese outright rejected them. And I think that was a real wake up call. Um, so for 2014, I expect that um, the South Koreans will continue to pursue things like a bilateral uh, FTA with China. Um, they'll continue to see cooperation on North Korea, but on these broader strategic issues, I think there'll be more of a, uh, a, a more of a realpolitik, realist lens on things, uh, and less of this uh, this honeymoon sort of feel in the relationship. Mm -hmm. Chris, what did you click on number two? Uh, I also clicked C, and I think uh, I think that fundamentally represents what we're seeing. I mean, I, the, the most important point to make is it's clear that the new leadership is taking a different approach uh, on foreign policy than their predecessors. Uh, you see very little discussion anymore internally or otherwise of Deng Xiaoping's longstanding guidance to you know hide your strength and bide your time. And, uh, someone I was speaking to recently, I thought, put it very well, which is that uh, you know we're not going to hide our strength anymore, but we are going to continue to bide our time, uh, and so I think that's a, a good way of thinking about it. But uh, underneath, it represents this fundamental kind of contradiction between their desire, as uh, manifested in some meetings that they had in October, late October of last year, to improve relations with the regional neighbors. I mean, that's clearly a goal. And there's no doubt about that, and you see again, sort of, a, especially towards Southeast Asia, the tilt again toward a uh, sort of smile diplomacy approach, and this desire to more assertively defend what they believe is their sovereignty claims. And the question is, can they have both and make it work? Uh, and I think most people would say no, but again, somewhat like the political economic dichotomy, they, they seem to think it's manageable. And if you, look, uh, if you look at what's transpired over the last couple of years, they've made some gains. Uh, you know, Scarborough Shoal is the first observable land feature to, to change hands in 20 years. So, you know, that's a significant point. Uh, so I think we just have to watch uh, how it rolls out going forward. Can I, can I just, <coughs> you, let me just follow up and then I'll come back to you. What, what have we learned in the last year about uh, Xi's relationship with the military and, and who's leading this policy? Yeah, thank you for raising that, Fred, because I think it's very important. Uh, after the ADIZ was announced, as is typical, there were a series of articles that came out suggesting that Xi Jinping's not control of the military, that yet again they were doing things on their own. This is ridiculous. Uh, this is a very different, uh, very different period now. Uh, and I think it's abundantly clear that he has brought them to heel in a way that Hu Jintao, his predecessor, was never able to do so. The best evidence, frankly, of that is the mill-mill relationship with the United States, which was terrible up until Xi Jinping came into power and basically ordered the PLA that they were going to fix that, 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 that the mill-mill relationship was too important and could not lag so substantially behind the overall relationship. So any question that he's not in control of, of his military is just foolhardy. And the tools, again, as I mentioned earlier, they're very similar. You know, he has a strong personal network through this princeling status in the military, which Hu Jintao never had. Um, Strangely enough, he has what passes for military experience in their system. He was a, a secretary to the defense minister in the early 1980s, and you know that sounds kind of silly, but but the official Chinese news service, when they started publishing his biography when he was first elevated to the Politburo Standing Committee, they made, uh, before he became to power, they made a point of noting that he was an active duty PLA officer during that time. You know, and I think that was designed to do that. And then third is anti-corruption. Uh, it's not as visible in the military as it is uh, in the civilian sector, but uh, I am told it's every bit as intense. So, I just wanted to close a loop here, which is that you know, for the rest of Asia, 
these facts on the ground that, that Chris is talking about with, with she, you know, sort of consolidating and the charm offensive combined with assertiveness is, um, is you know, it really is creating a big demand pull for <coughs> stronger and more focused <coughs> American engagement. And, you know, they're not getting that. You know, a Southeast Asian watching the, the State of the Union address last night would have been really disappointed uh, that the lack of focus on Asia, the lack of focus, no mention of Southeast Asia, a, a passing mention, I thought, on, on trade, didn't mention the TPP, <coughs> mentioned um, TPA in sort of a, a one-line sentence uh, about the rest of uh, uh, sort of economic empowerment. So well, you know, this is it, really in causing such a brief, In such a brief address, it's not surprising. You can't, you can't get to everything. Um, what, what would they like to see from the United States? You know, I think, I think what Asia really wants to see, the, the, the Asia that's concerned about some of the facts that Chris is talking about, is they'd like to see the President of the United States talk about why Asia is important to Americans, to talk about why Asia is important to um, your, your, the jobs uh, that, that, that bring home the mortgage money, that pay for the kids' school, that the, you know, talk about the fact that Asia will be part of your, whether your kids are competitive and, and able to, to thrive and prosper, uh, that, that Asia is absolutely critical. We saw it from our first questions here. M most of this audience is a pretty well-advised audience, thinks there is a potential for real conflict in Asia. So it is the number one concern, I think, for American security. But our political leaders aren't talking to Americans about that. And I think that's what Asia is looking for. It, it, the, the military uh, engagement has is, is been pretty consistent. Um, I think policy has been pretty consistent between, you know, between parties and, and leaders. But what needs to change is, the, is a, a leader, an American leader, who will tell Americans that Asia is important, and that is why we're going to step up our level of engagement there. That's what I think they're looking for. Mm -hmm. um, Victor, what are you seeing in terms of the U.S.? presence that, that uh, is desired and, and the presence that, that people there are seeing? Well, I, I mean, I wouldn't disagree with what Ernie said. I mean, you know, obviously the metric is um, if you see the president out there talking about trade or security or any of these things with, uh, with Asian allies and partners um, to a broader audience in the United, not a special, you know, not an audience like this, but actually a broader audience in the United States, um, you know, in middle America and elsewhere. Um, um, now, of course, I understand given where they are in their second term, it, it's, this is not necessarily the priority in terms of the message they're trying to send at home. Um, but I would just say that the administration should look back to its first term in office where, uh, whether it was the Secretary of State or the President himself, uh, Asia was very much a part of uh, both, obviously, her travel schedule, but in his speeches here in the United States. He'd weave Asia uh, into his discussions, and that's pretty much absent now. And I think, you know, it, you know, like so. I look at the Korean Peninsula, and uh, when I talk to both security folks and financial folks, and in terms of forecasting, um, you know, we clearly have problems on the Korean Peninsula, North Korea being one of them. But um, markets and things don't move based on what North Korea does; they move based on how the U.S. responds. They're always looking for the U.S. response. Uh, again, whether it's investors or whether it's the policymakers, and I think they feel like they're knocking on a door and nobody's answering these days. Hmm. <clears throat> let, let me just push, on, and any of you can answer, because I think uh, if somebody from the administration were up here, they would probably say, <clears throat> well, you know, maybe it wasn't in the speech and, and we don't have anybody quite as visible as Kurt Campbell, but Mike Froman is out there. We're negotiating the most uh, far-reaching trade pact ever. Uh, Chuck Hagel's been there four times. You know, we're proceeding with our basing changes, and so the actual meat of uh, pivot is is still on the bone. Um, I mean, I would I would just say, can you imagine the the scene? You know, where. Obama, the president, comes back from the State of the Union address, comes back to the White House, and there Mike Froman's in his office saying, you know, when I went over, when I left the White House and walked across the street <clears throat> to USTR, you promised me that you would spend political capital 
to get uh, trade agreements done, specifically TPA and the European agreement, uh, TTIP. Now, come on, I was expecting a little more in the speech to Congress. You know, I would expect you guys, you to follow through on your commitment to me, your good friend, Mike Froman, um, uh, so that I can get this done. And it's good for the United States. We both know that. I believe the president knows that. Um, and you know, where's the beef, man? I, I think that's what uh, that's that's the discussion. That w I don't know how it happened. I'm just making this up, of course. But I, I think that's uh, that was an important part of mm -hmm. what we're missing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, so obviously, I mean, yes, TPP is very important. It's. Um, it has not only huge trade implications, but I think it has broader long-term strategic implications, particularly if um, other countries join after the initial framework agreement. Um, but having said that, I mean, it's not done yet. <laughs> and uh, yes, certainly they, they deserve a lot of credit for trying, but you know, administrations and their policies in different parts of the world are not remembered for trying. It's just being remembered for what you got done. And so I think this obviously is a big part. It is. The pivot is TPP right now, I think, mm -hmm. um, and, and, that, and so there's a lot riding on that. In terms of the other things you mentioned, Fred, I mean, I, I, you know, yes, trips to the region are important. They're quite important in Asia. Um, you know, finishing implementation of some of these base realignment agreements and a very important step was made on the Japan side with regard to Futenma. Um, but again, I think, the, you know, metrics for administrations like in Asia are not really um, uh, grounded in the agreements they try to get or the agreements they finish, it's what they do that's new. Um, and, and right now that's TPP, yeah. but there really isn't much else. Yeah. Let me ask one more thing on this, uh, because it strikes me that um, I think everybody here clicked C, and Victor talked a little bit about charm offensive in the Korea context, but if, I wonder if you, you uh, the others could say uh, specifically where else, I mean, we see the assertiveness with the air identification zone. Give us an example of charm offensive if, you, if you've seen one in Southeast Asia. Well, I'll tell you, nothing is as charming to Southeast Asians as uh, money. Uh, and, uh, and China... Which, which maybe doesn't make them unique. Well, yeah, it is very charming. Uh, especially when you look northward and you see uh, what will be the world's largest economy uh, buying your stuff. And, uh, and now starting to, uh, starting to invest. We have to say, be honest, though. I mean, if you look at um, countries in Southeast Asia and even Australia, uh, Chinese investment hasn't really been a top line story. Uh, it probably will be, but it hasn't been yet. Um, but the promise of investment is very hopeful. The thing that the Chinese could offer to Southeast Asia that Japan had not been able to offer was um, we, can, we will increase our purchases of your goods. In other words, your exports to China will increase, and they have. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, uh, that's extremely charming, the most charming part of, of Chinese uh, diplomacy. Yeah. I, I would say also that, let, let's be honest, I mean, Chinese diplomats, since the, the, the real charm offensive started, which was just after the Asian financial crisis, Chinese diplomats in Southeast Asia have become much more, uh, become listeners. Uh, talking about alignment with Southeast Asian goals. Um, a little bit of edge on that now. But man, I mean, compared to the early 90s, uh, Chinese diplomacy in Asia has done very well. Uh, I mean, I think that's a big, it's a big new feature. You can really feel it uh, if, you're, uh, if you're around uh, in Southeast Asia. So mm -hmm. those two things uh, would be on the top of my list. Mm -hmm. I agree with all that. I just include as well uh, an equally charming thing that they've done, which is uh, the development of the ASEAN Infrastructure Bank uh, and China's willingness to put a, a large amount of money in there. Uh, you know, one thing I think Southeast Asia needs badly is infrastructure, and uh, you know the Chinese are willing to pour significant assets into that entity. Um, they don't have some of the regulatory concerns that other countries may have, and so on. So uh, that's a big deal. Mm -hmm. All right, let's put the audience back to work. Number three, <clears throat> Japan-China tensions over the, pick your name, islands will increase, remain the same, decrease, don't know. All right, 
I just hope the war doesn't start before 11 a.m. so I can get back to the office. Um, <coughs> Victor, what did you click? Um, I, I clicked A, increase. Um, um, there, there, um, a couple of them. I mean, first, there's, I see nothing in the trend lines either in China or uh, Japanese um, domestic politics that lead one to believe we're getting closer to a, a solution or even a, a, an agreement on the status quo. Um, um, I, I think in addition to that, um, there is the, you know, there's this broader dynamic where, in a sense, Structurally, we have these two countries in the region that both see themselves, um, one is in recovery and the other is on the rise. Um, and if it's not the Senkaku Dayutai Islands, it's going to be something else that we see quarrels between the Japanese and the Chinese on. So uh, for that reason, I think for both structural reasons and political reasons, I don't see this thing getting any better um, and perhaps getting worse precisely because of things like the ADIZ and, um, uh, and the increased uh, activity that we're seeing in that, in that, in that area. And, and talk us through a little bit, what, you know, what does worse look like? I mean, is there a real danger of conflict and uh, how would that happen? Uh, I how, think, how can it yeah. be avoided? No, I, I mean, Chris can also say, I think the, the primary, primary thing that everybody's worried about is some sort of miscalculation or accident. Um, and uh, whether that could then spiral into something worse, nobody really knows, but, uh, but certainly a miscalculation or some sort of accident uh, would spark a crisis that I think would affect um, not just policy, I think it would affect markets too. I mean, people would be quite concerned about something like that. Chris, I don't know how you... Uh, I would just add two broad points and, and just echo what Mike said in his opening about how investors, to, to echo your point, Victor, and, and hedge fund people are thinking about this. I mean, they're, they're definitely concerned. I guess the c big concern that I have with regard to this is listening recently in conversations with both senior Chinese people and senior Japanese people. The worry that I have is that increasingly, I think it's fair to say both sides uh, have are now subscribing to the worst possible character, uh, caricaturing of the other side's intentions and, and so on. And to me, it's very hard to have dialogue when you have dehumanized the other guy. Uh, and so that makes things very difficult. I think it increases the, the bar for trying to make progress on the situation. Um, the second point, I guess, that, that I would make is that I personally hope and would feel that if there were this kind of an accident scenario, both sides would have extreme desire, you know, for restraint, as, of course, the U.S. would be right there, you know, trying to, uh, to cause the temperature to come down. The problem is that in the past, Japan and China had some very effective back-channel mechanisms. Very senior people on both sides, you know, had a kind of, in case of emergency, break glass person that they could go to. That has really uh, gone by the wayside now in the long period of cool political relations. And so without those kind of mechanisms, you do see these nationalist trends that we've been talking about. You can see a situation where the respective leaderships get handcuffed pretty quickly, you know, if there were some sort of accident scenario. And I think, you know, this is where Vice President Biden was, you know, correct in his visit to suggest, you know, we got to figure out some mechanism for dealing with this. Mm -hmm. um, there were in events in both countries um, recently that sort of underscored how cool the relations are. Um, Prime Minister Abe's visit to the shrine and uh, the one that fascinated me was the Chinese agreement to build the Memorial Hall in Harbin. And let me ask each of you, what do you think were the calculations in the leaders' minds in taking those steps which they had to know would worsen relations? Start, Victor, start with Yaskuni, if you would. <clears throat> well, let's put um, this way. I don't think that Prime Minister Abe was not aware of the re repercussions from going to Yaskuni. I think he was fully aware of the, of the repercussions from going. Um, and, um, uh, and I think he got advice from all sorts of people about what he should and should not do. Um, I think the decision was very much a personal one. And, um, and, uh, and I mean, I'm probably going to offend all my Korean friends, but, uh, but I think, at, and at the same time, I think he knew that it would be harmful to relations, and so he had that passage 
in the statement about how he didn't wish to offend the other, the other countries. Um, does this mean he's not going to go again? I don't think anybody knows. I don't think anybody knows whether this is he's, he's done or whether he'll go again. Um, but I think this was very much a, a personal decision and one he obviously strongly believes in because he was fully aware of the costs mm -hmm. that would come with doing this. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> Do you think it's partly, you know, well, I tr we've tried to reach out to China and Korea. We don't get anything back, so why bother? There's, there's nothing to lose here? Yeah, I, I certainly, on the, on the tactical side, I certainly think there were, you know, th there was that. Because, uh, uh, um, you know, you could argue that they did try to, um, in 2013, try to do things that, attempted to reach out to both the, um, the Koreans and the Japanese, even if some of them were just gestures, there were still things that they tried to do and also things that Prime Minister Abe did not do, whether it was on um, uh, other historical issues. Um, um, and I think by the end of 2013, they figured tactically again, just get this done, get it out of the way, start 2014 anew. Um, but again, I don't think the tactical the tactical calculations may have mattered for his advisors, but I think for him it was a very personal mm -hmm. decision. Mm -hmm. okay. How about the Harvey Memorial Hall? Is yeah. that? I have to say I'm kind of surprised they did that myself because I, I talked to people about this and I think most people said, no, we're not going to do it. Uh, so it says something. Uh, you know, the, I spoke a minute ago about the caricature, caricature problem. and. The Yasukuni visit just plays right into that, you know, um, very, very deeply. And, and you know, as Victor suggested, it has resonance with other players. And I agree 100% from the Chinese side uh, to Victor's earlier points about how the Chinese see an opportunity to try to peel South Korea off uh, and use this issue as an opportunity to do that. And so I presume that was in the back of their minds on, on the Harbin mm -hmm. decision. Let, let me ask you, Ernie, after these two incidents, uh, the two ambassadors to, to the United States each wrote op-eds in the Post. And part of their themes seemed to be uh, persuading Southeast Asia that the other country is the bad guy, or persuading Americans that Southeast Asia views the other country as the bad guy. And I, I wonder what what's your perception of that? I, I really think that this the whole tension in Northeast Asia um, that we've been talking about really concerns Southeast Asia because it does, you think? It, does. Uh -huh. uh, it it's a huge concern and it, it makes it hard for Southeast Asia to know where to put its foot um, but I, I think what 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 is really important here and I hate to go back to this theme is that um, I, I think that part of the what we're seeing with Abe's actions with Chinese actions I, I think you know part of the title of this panel is leadership um, if, if you don't have sort of a, a strong and evident uh, and engaged American leadership engaging in the region, I think it actually helps cause some of these actions, some of these leaders to take steps that, in a way, I mean, you could argue, I think you could argue from, a, from my perspective and perhaps a Southeast Asia perspective that Abe has to define himself as his own man uh, because Japan has to have an identity. They've got to have a, sort of a confident view of what is Japan. And I think um, that in a way that's um, a behavior that is created, uh, I believe, uh, in part because uh, you know, we haven't been as active uh, in those places. And I think that's, that, Fred, worries Southeast Asia. I mean, when I sit down with the guys who run um, the countries in Southeast Asia, they are really concerned about what the implications are of having uh, the Chinese sort of build this narrative that it's their time. Um, they can push uh, three years uh, of sort of taking as much as they can. I think most Southeast Asians that I talk to believe there could be an ADIZ somewhere over all of or part of the South China Sea as the next step. This worries people. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I, I think. Um, I am not, obviously you can, you can sort of connect the dots here, I'm, I'm not okay with where we are in terms of our levels of engagement mm -hmm. uh, in, in Asia right now. And, and, and you're saying if, if Japan's identity can't be 
close U.S. ally, then it's going to be something else. Uh, I mean, I, I would really love to have Mike Green, you know, up here talking about this because he, he knows the man, he knows the country well. But that's my sense, that this is, uh, that Abe's visit to Yakasuni is some sort of a way to say, I'm my own person. Uh, Japan's going to be its own country. We have to be. Uh, in a way, I see it as a sort of a cry for more attention, more help. And um, I'm, not, I'm not a Japan expert, but I think from Southeast Asia's point of view, I don't think ASEAN can be sort of this strong core, this fulcrum for regional um, security and trade uh, architecture that will help bring the Chinese in to play by the rules and make, make the rules with everybody else, unless uh, Japan and the United States and Australia really look at ASEAN and say, this is our expectation of you, mm -hmm. to be that strong core. Mm -hmm. Because ASEAN won't do it on its own. It just can't. It's too diverse. But if its role, uh, if, if it believes that everyone else depends on it to play this role, I think ASEAN will really step up and surprise us. Um, that's my view. Mm -hmm. I mean, so I'll step in as the poor substitute for Mike Green on this. Um, too, too bad he's not here. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. <laughs> Although he's turning really red, I see. He's just like, <laughs> um, I, you know, I don't think um, that, I mean, Prime, Prime Minister Abe does things like go to Yasukuni because he's trying to cut an identity that's somehow separate for the nation under his leadership from the United States. I mean, I think uh, very much his core is still a, very much of a pro-alliance view. And um, despite many, um, you know, Chinese media and other efforts to try to paint him a different way, I mean, I do think that he, obviously he believes that Japan is back. He believes that at least some of the arrows of his economic policy are working. Um, and that things like visiting Yasukuni or um, uh, reinterpreting the right of collective self-defense are, uh, for him, I think, contextualized in a view of Japan playing a larger role as a global citizen, sort of this idea of nationalism as, as citizenship in a, in a global uh, context rather than some sort of resurgence of pre-war mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, nationalism. Now, I know, obviously, many in the region don't see it that way. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but personally, it's hard for me to imagine anybody in their right mind thinking that um, the themes or, or, or even believing in their core that somehow uh, pre-war, you know, Japanese nationalism is the right path for Japan. It's just very hard to imagine, even for someone like uh, Abe. Maybe some of his advisors feel that way, but certainly not. I, I certainly don't think the prime minister feels that way. Yeah. yeah. And, I, you know, I think something that sometimes gets lost in, in the reporting also is, you know, particularly when China or others talk about this resurgence of nationalism is how the Japanese people have always had to be dragged toward a more active role and toward changing the constitution and toward increasing the military. It's not like there's this huge popular groundswell uh, to, to become what Abe considers a normal country. Uh, so. Even I would say for the, if we take something like reinterpreting the right of collective self-defense, you talk to Koreans and they start banging the table and they're like, this is, Ridiculous! The United States is basically, basically making Japan their proxy in Asia now because they're not interested in Asia in the second term of Obama. And yet, at the same time, they understand a, the right of reinterpreting the right of collective self-defense leads to a better functioning U.S.-Japan alliance with regard to contingencies like North Korea. And they're like, "Oh yeah, that's true too." <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, <clears throat> let's move on to something where things are going really well: North Korea. Uh, <clears throat> question number four, do you believe North Korea has a deliverable nuclear capability, undefined, uh, or will achieve it in 2014? Well, I guess that's a bit of optimism from the audience. Um, <clears throat> any of you? Any of you want to give what the real, the correct answer is to that question, <laughs> Professor? Um, so I'm going to disagree with the audience. Um, of course, you know you have to define what you mean by deliverable uh, nuclear capabilities. Um, um, so there are three major steps here, and they've crossed one of them, which is to be able to uh, put a payload vehicle into orbit. Um, the other two are to miniaturize a warhead 
and to be able to do a successful reentry vehicle. And um, while we don't have very good information on exactly how far along they are, um, I am always impressed about how uh, we underestimate their capabilities. I mean, when they did the last um, uh, rocket test that was it, that they were successful in putting a payload vehicle into orbit, uh, nobody had expected that at the time. Um, the, um, I think 2014 is actually going to be a very important year in terms of the North Korea problem uh, uh, on the military side. I mean, it was um, Secretary Gates who three and a half years ago said he believed that North Korea would have a capability to threaten the continental United States within five years. Um, and, uh, and I certainly do expect um, uh, more testing by the North Koreans in 2014 both of their missiles and of um, uh, their nuclear weapons. Um, their, you know, the big concern now, of course, is, is they have an old rickety plutonium program, which um, uh, Mike and I spent hours and days and weeks negotiating over. <clears throat> but the real concern now is this covert uranium program, which could be much more plentiful as a source of <clears throat> fissile material for weapons. Um, and they're, you know, constructing, reconstructing, renovating major missile sites from which they could do testing. So um, I am quite concerned that um, they will make further steps along this path in 2014. And of course, there's nothing in the ideology or the statements of the North Korean regime under this young fellow that lead one to believe that they are somehow going to give up or move away from this path. And <clears throat> I mean, that leads to another question, which um, is sort of, well, what difference does it make? Um, you know, it's been U.S. policy since before you were running it that this is intolerable and we're not going to allow it and North Korea is not a nuclear state and Secretary Perry was almost ready to go to war over it. Uh, and yet, you know, here they are and life goes on and um, so will we yeah. just keep going that way or, or what? Um, well, I think, um, so I think the things that are different is, are that if we're, if we're actually talking about a demonstrated um, capability to miniaturize a warhead and to target the United States with, with a long range um, uh, ballistic missile, that's, that's different. We've not really had that situation before. It's been much more of a local threat. The threat of proliferation has and will continue to be there. The, but the concept that uh, you know a country like North Korea would be the first uh, um, weapon state you know outside of uh, uh, Ch uh, China and Russia to be able to actually target the United States with a nuclear warhead, um, I think would be quite concerning. The other thing is that you know, that um, although there's a bit of head in the sand when it comes to how the North Korean drive for nuclear weapons is changing the balance of forces or the strategic context of the region, I think it would have an impact um, uh, if, this were a, if this were a demonstrated capability. And then the third, third thing that I think makes this different is the leadership in North Korea. We just, we don't know anything about this guy aside from, I mean, Dennis Rodman knows the most about this guy. <laughs> Nobody else knows more about Kim Jong-un than Dennis Rodman. And, and, um, and so you can't, you can't, and he's not, he's not talking, he's in rehab somewhere. So. Um, so, I mean, you cannot, I mean, seriously, you cannot make up a more frightening scenario than this. And so is there more the U.S. or different that the U.S. could or should be doing? Um, unfortunately, there isn't. Um, the, uh, I mean, I think the main action right now and for the future is um, to work with the Chinese to try to put together an even uh, more, much more robust set of sanctions in response to the next North Korean provocation. We did an event here at CSIS a couple of months ago where we looked at um, the sanctions on Iran and the sanctions on North Korea. And one of the scholars who participated built this graphic that had, that was a timeline of the evolution of sanctions on Iran. And it was, uh, it, it was based on sort of the number of participants and the scope of the sanctions and compare that to North Korea. And so we think that we have sanctions on North Korea, luxury goods and all this stuff. But um, when he put up the graphic on North Korea, the circle was about this big. 
when he put up the graphic on the Iran, it was like this big. <laughs> so um, there's a lot more, I think, that can be done uh, with regard to North Korean sanctions. And, and, you know, I think Glenn Davies is in the region right now um, trying to move a diplomatic process forward, and, and they should continue to do that. But um, I think the real action is going to be in terms of seeing if there can be pro any progress made with the Chinese and with the Russians on um, really stepping up the sanctions in response to the next provocation. And Chris, I mean, this is the perennial question, but do the Chinese really care, and uh, could they do more? And if, not, if so, why don't they? Well, the third question is the hardest one. Uh, uh, of course they care. Uh, of course they could do more. I mean, you know, that's, that's, that's known. I, I think what's interesting you know, you may recall last year around the same time there was a huge debate in the commentariat as to whether or not China under the new leadership had changed their policy, you know, toward North Korea. And that phrasing in itself is a loaded term, right? Uh, but I think it is fair to say that we've certainly seen a reordering of priorities um, with the new leadership. I think we've seen a willingness to push the North Koreans a little bit harder, but obviously not to do anything that they might consider destabilizing. Um, one thing that's been interesting in recent discussions uh, is the Chinese, as Victor just suggested, have been starting to talk about a larger Russian role in concert with us and in concert with themselves. And that's interesting, you know, something we should consider. Um, in some ways it's unique because there's a way to draw that line in the region, you know, standing nuclear powers or standing members of the UN Security Council, you know, however you might do that, that, that then allows you to draw a clean line without having to get messier by, but it may be a place to start. I mean, the problem is, my feeling is, and I'm no Russia expert, but it seems to me they're sitting on the sidelines either because they're distracted or they think now is not the right time or, or whatever the case may be, or maybe they're just disinterested, I don't know. But I think we've been seeing some unique signs from the Chinese that they're willing to do more. The hard part is getting to, you know, what do they mean by that? What are, what are the concrete steps and proposals? I think one thing that we should not lose sight of and speaks to the point Victor was making about 2014 is a busy year. The Chinese populace, especially in the border region uh, in the Northeast, they're becoming very concerned uh, about these nuclear tests. And they use the same test site every time, and uh, it's causing seismic disruptions. There's a lot of theories about whether it's going to has potential for earthquake you know, problems and things like this. So at least there's more pressure on the Chinese regime at the popular level um, to deal with this problem. You know, nuclear fallout coming across the border, all of these sort of issues. I think, though, right now, they're just as shocked and surprised as everybody else about the recent domestic, uh, you know, how, developments. How do you, in how do you see that? Uh, oh, well, I mean, I'm going to defer to Victor largely, but on the Chinese side, uh, you know, Chang Song Tech was kind of their guy to the degree they had a guy. Uh, and they've seen this movie before when, uh, Kim yeah, when Kim Jong-un's father basically executed all of the generals in the North Korean system that were perceived as close to mm -hmm. the Chinese, you know, and so on. So um, to the degree that someone they thought was trustworthy, somebody that they thought embraced the idea that they're always flogging with the North Koreans, which is follow our model of opening the system and so on, um, is now gone, I think causes them to, one, worry just about the core issue of stability inside the system. As Victor said, nobody knows anything about this guy. Um, but more importantly, uh, they've lost touch with, is this guy manageable, as he said, you know, and this, the debate continues inside China just like it does here, and I've heard Victor say several times, which I think is right, you know, younger Kim's father, he knew where that red line was and he knew how to dance right around it, but, you know, not go across it, and it doesn't seem that the son has that level of fidelity, but obviously I defer to Victor on that. I, I mean, I, I don't disagree with that. I mean, I think the main thing that we're watching for China is, is so Chang Sung Tech, you know, the uncle, he was not just China's guy. I think he was everybody's guy <laughs> outside of North Korea. Anybody who had any sort of contact with the North Korean, Chang Sung Tech was their guy. So, um, and I think, um, you know, prior to that happening, I think U.S. policymakers were quietly feeling like they were making co a progress consulting with the Chinese about sort of, you know, um, uh, sort of raising the temperature in North Korea little by little and, you know, doing, I think they felt like they were making quiet progress. And then after Tsang's execution, um, you know, I think as Chris said, nobody has a feel, including the Chinese, for what's going on inside of North Korea. So from a U.S. policy perspective, the question is, is China going to 
continue to work in this very quiet and begrudging way um, to raise the temperature, uh, you know, a la Iran, or are they going to, going to double down and basically say we've held this young punk at arm's length um, up until now. Um, since we have nobody else, maybe we have to embrace him. And so I think that's a big question going forward in terms of, uh, in terms of the North Korea problem in China. Interesting. Okay, let's, um, we have a bunch of other questions. We have one more in Japan, Korea, and then we want to get up to Southeast Asia a little bit, and I want to have some time for questions from the audience. Um, so, Japan, Korea, political and historical tensions will <clears throat> um, well, given the current situation, I don't think we can call that optimism, but uh, not total gloom, maybe. Um, uh, Victor, I'm sorry to come back to you, but let me ask two questions in this context. One is, um, do you think, well, I think the Japanese have been surprised that the President Park has been so um, uh, unwilling to respond to what they see as their overtures. How do you see her policy? What's the origin of it? Is she leading or following public opinion? And more broadly, I think a lot of Americans would say, Okay, it's been a long time since Japanese colonialism. Uh, most of the people we're polling in South Korea have no memory of it. Why is there more antipathy now than 20 years ago, if in fact there is? Um, well, all, all good questions. Um, first on whether she's leading or following public opinion, I think her record thus far shows that she really doesn't care about public opinion. Um, she's got her own very strong views, and in this case, uh, whether it was, you know, and all of us are trying to figure this out, whether it was their, the first interaction between President Park and um, then Special Envoy Aso when, she, when he came for her uh, inauguration or, or what it was, it, it's just gotten off to a very bad start. And public opinion, actually, we've done some polling, and public opinion in Korea is actually not as bad as people think. On, on, on Japan. Um, we did some polling where we asked folks to rank, um, you know, what issues mattered to them most in terms of their support for their government. And we, you know, we put a number of things, history being one of them, and it, and it, do, it did not rank highly at all. Um, so I think in that sense, she's, uh, this is her, these are her own views. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I think we're, I, I, I clicked um, B, remain the same. And I think that's a pessimistic assessment, actually, because uh, I, too, don't think this can go on forever. Uh, after Yasukuni, basically, a timeout has been called on all exchanges for now. Um, I think that'll probably last through till the spring, um, March, April. And then I think uh, both sides, I, I think they're trying to, in, responsible individuals are trying to do it now, but both sides are going to try to work really hard to um, reach some sort of reconciliation by the fall, because you know that would be an op a potential opportunity in New York at UNGA. That would be a potential opportunity for the for the two leaders to meet. Um, <clears throat> I, I think the one issue where there is a great deal of emotion in Korea, aside from the larger colonial issue, the one issue that has been most politically salient has been the comfort women issue. Um, where uh, if you talk to South Korean uh, folks, uh, you know, Yasukuni, the visit's been, the visit happened, it's done, and in a sense they've kind of moved beyond that, I think the Koreans, um, unlike China, I think the Koreans were uh, not willing to be as vocal about uh, the Yasukuni visit and really have sort of said it's done, it's over with, uh, but the comfort woman issue remains a salient one. And I think that's going to be the primary obstacle going forward. Um, I do think that both um, uh, both our Japanese and Korean friends have come to the United States asking for help in terms of uh, not mediating, perhaps being a good listener to, uh, to, to both sides. Um, but I do sense, I mean, there's fatigue about 
Korea and Japan, there's fatigue about Japan and Korea, and I think there's some fatigue now in the United States uh, about this, uh, the constant griping between the, between the two sides. Um, so I guess when, you're, when it's at rock bottom, the only place you can go is up, mm -hmm. and I think that's sort of where we are in the, in the Japan-Korea relationship. And, uh, but again, for 2014, I would say that the important thing is responsible individuals on all three sides understand that this is a priority that needs to be worked on and I think they are going to work on it quietly behind closed doors. And the other is, you know, when, when everything gets as bad as it, as it does, you can always rely on the North Koreans. <laughs> uh, because there's a good chance, I think, that the North Koreans will, you know, they, they really haven't tested Pak geun yet. She's been in office more than a year and they really haven't tested her and, and, and I think they're, they're going to. And, um, you know, that can be an opportunity to put, sort of put a shock into the system and get everybody to focus on cooperating on things that really matter. Uh, I, I shouldn't say really matter, but certainly matter in the present day from a, a political and military security context. So. There, there have been some people who've said uh, on the comfort women that Japan really needs to take another step and uh, there's more that it could do or its companies could do. Uh, and then I hear some Japanese, say, even Japanese who acknowledge that their first round of apology sounded grudging or that, well, how can we take another step when there's no guarantee that that will be the last step and they'll always ask for more. Uh, do you see a role for diplomacy there? Um, yeah, I think, I mean, I think that there were, well, I, I think on comfort women very specifically, I think the, um, a pretty clear line has been drawn, and I don't think it's one that's um, um, uh, difficult to achieve in the sense that um, I think what people are looking for is essentially a reaffirmation of the Kono statement and the Muriyama apology. So in other words, getting back to the status quo, um, how difficult that'll be for the Abe administration, I can't really say. Um, in terms of the, uh, the concern that these historical issues are resolved only to reemerge the following year. I mean, this I think is a very valid concern on all sides. Um, you know, whether it's the apologizer or the, the apologizee, mm -hmm. I think both feel that these issues can, can reemerge. And there, unfortunately, I don't think there's a good answer. I mean, there can be political commitments uh, made by both sides. Uh, but, you know, the fact of the matter is these are two democracies, leaderships change, and we could see, um, you know, some Japanese official that says something that is offensive or um, a, another Supreme Court ruling in Korea that decides that more Japanese companies are liable for conscripted labor. Um, that, unfortunately, is the nature of this. And again, the view, I think, my view has always been we're never going to solve these problems. We just have to avoid them uh, having an impact on sort of actual alliance functions. Mm -hmm. And clearly they're having an impact now, whether it's military information sharing, uh, currency swap um, agreements, um, these are having a real impact. Mm -hmm. Smart. Okay, um, question number six, which of the best, the following best characterizes Myanmar, also known as Burma's, approach to its chairmanship of ASEAN in 2014. A, produces concrete agenda for regional cooperation. B, responsible custodian. C, benign neglect. D, lean tilt toward China. E, don't know. I guess there's no, no option for malign, uh, <coughs> malign intervention. Um, All right, a big don't know. Well, it's good we have an expert who can tell us what the right answer is. <clears throat> did you say Burma? I did. <clears throat> I thought so. So did the president last night <clears throat> in his speech. Uh, he mentioned two Asian countries, Japan and Burma. Um, but um, look, I, I, think, I think Myanmar is going to surprise people, um, and it's in the process of doing so. I, I picked B here, Fred. Um, I think that um, Myanmar is actually working uh, very hard to uh, play the role of responsible custodian. They want to uh, 
Um, they want to be uh, exactly that. They want to be a responsible and respected part of ASEAN. We, uh, we've done a lot of work on Myanmar here at CSIS, and sort of the core question that everyone had when Myanmar made the decision to sort of go for political reform, really ahead of economic reform, the very un-Asian model uh, of, of a reform sequencing uh, to do pol politics before economics. But we asked um, just about everybody, uh, current leaders, the military, the opposition, Aung San Suu Kyi, the president, the, the parliament, uh, people who've been in jail, civil society, uh, the diplomatic corps. You know, why did Myanmar make this move towards reform? And I think at, at the core of it was a desire uh, for the country to uh, return to its role as, uh, you know, and historically they remember when in the 50, in the 40s and 50s, when Myanmar um, was moving out of its, into its own independence uh, from the UK or from Britain and then Japan and then from Britain again, um, you know, Myanmar was one of the countries that uh, was seen as uh, the bright lights of Southeast Asia. It had the best medical school, the best university. Um, its, uh, it, its leader was the head of the UN. Um, a Burmese was the head of the, the UN. Mm -hmm. And I think um, they really want to do a good job with this. This coupled with the fact, and, and another factor was a certain sense of claustrophobia uh, with um, a dependence on China. Uh, the, the Chinese had had uh, over two decades of, of really dominant uh, control over uh, Myanmar, uh, their supply lines um, from a military point of view and, and certainly economically and they really want some balance there. So um, the, the, the real task uh, will be for Myanmar to, uh, in its role as ASEAN chair, uh, to avoid um, uh, what is already a, a, a very strong campaign uh, by the Chinese to push enough money into Myanmar to um, make, uh, like they did in Cambodia, uh, to make uh, and gain assurances that certain things will not be on the agenda at important meetings for ASEAN and the East Asia Summit, uh, which President Obama will hopefully attend uh, this fall uh, with, with the other leaders. Um, I, think, I think Myanmar is absolutely committed to avoid that sort of trap. And I don't think Myanmar will be anywhere near uh, where Cambodia was. I think Myanmar's chairmanship of ASEAN will look a lot like Brunei's which was, um, and you can see that they're taking a lot of the same steps. They've got a, a good group of advisors. They've reached out for help. Uh, they are setting the agenda early so that uh, they can um, manage these issues well. Um, the biggest challenge for them is bandwidth, and um, they just don't have the people, um, the depth and the number of people who are in important positions to, to manage these roles. Uh, so I think that's why ASEAN has provided a lot of help here, and um, you'll, if you go to Yangon and Napada uh, these days, there'll be a lot of ASEAN um, uh, citizens, uh, people from Singapore, uh, Bangkok, Indonesia, uh, and other places who are there specifically to help uh, create the agenda, get things sort of cemented in bureaucratically so that you can't be, uh, you can't get um, tilted uh, by China. And. Um, I would say the other big question on Myanmar or Burma is uh, internal. Mm -hmm. um, there are those of us who think the administration's proclamations of victory for its democracy agenda in this country are a little premature. And obviously um, it still has a constitution that enshrines the military as the controlling agent. Aung San Suu Kyi can't run. And now you've had this, this surge of Buddhist nationalism and violence against Muslims. Um, to what extent do you think uh, they think their political reform has gone far enough and they can be accepted now by the U.S. and inside ASEAN? Uh, to what extent will there be domestic pressure to go further? What, what will this year bring? I, I don't see chest pounding um, sort of confidence or uh, um, Self, you know, a sense of self-satisfaction among anyone in, in Myanmar. I think quite the opposite. I think if you, you talk to the, the current leadership, uh, particularly Tain Sen, president, um, he's, he's a pretty humble guy. Uh, he is 
he is working with Aung San Suu Kyi uh, very closely behind the scenes to try to thread a needle. And the needle that those two, I think, are, are trying to thread. They're also com political competitors, so believe me, this is not sort of a, you know, it's not a complete partnership. But they do have a common interest, which is to, to see that the reform is effective and sustained. And the threat to them would be uh, reactivist groups in the military, and it's a real threat, uh, that if things go sort of wrong or out of control, that there could be sort of a recidivist um, a campaign led by the military that would um, pull back the reforms. So I think I, what I see uh, in, in leadership, the responsible parts of the leadership there, is a, is a much more humble uh, view of this, um, a, a very sophisticated and nuanced dance that's going on uh, between the, the current leadership and Aung San Suu Kyi and her party. I think on the question of the Constitution, uh, where she can't run, um, that she is pushing hard on that. But I also believe that if, if the Constitution is not amended for a number of reasons uh, before the 2015 elections, that, she will, that NLD will still run, uh, they'll win, uh, and then she will uh, act from, a, uh, from the view of an incumbent. I, I think that the view I have is that uh, the military is not one on this issue. They're not a unified, issue. They're not a unified force on politics and that uh, I think Aung San Suu Kyi also believes that, and that um, hopefully she can run in 2015, but if she can't, I think that um, the plan is to find a way to win and then get that 25% of that, some part of that 25% that you mentioned that is cemented into the um, parliamentary representation to come across the aisle and vote for um, amendments and so that she can then become uh, she could she could be a leader of her party. She could have more influence, but really open up the uh, constitution at that mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. um, I do want to get uh, time for audience. Can we skip to question eight? Is that? Uh, let's go to question number eight and do one more clicker and then open the floor. Which of the following best describes your expectations for President Obama's travel to the region this year? Uh, a, strength in regional solidarity to manage China. B, a tilt toward China. C, progress on TPP. D, renewed focus on Southeast Asia. E, crisis over the debt ceiling forces him to cancel the trip. <laughs> <coughs> so who's winning? C. Um, let me just start and ask each of you to answer this one. Chris, why don't you go first? Uh, well, I said none of the above <laughs> because I think they're all, uh, they're all too definitive, I guess. I think we're going to see elements of all of those things on the, on the trip. I would say that the one thing that concerns me a little bit is just uh, so far as Mike mentioned, we have a, an emerging list of countries. Um, obviously, it's a big issue as to whether China is going to be one of those countries. It's not looking very likely. And I don't think that's a problem in the, in the China-U.S. Uh, relationship, per se. The Chinese certainly will understand. They'll be disappointed, but they'll understand if he doesn't come. The bigger picture is we all know how your colleagues in the media are going to spin that, though, if he just goes to the Philippines, Malaysia, Japan, and possibly Korea. This is the rebalance strangling its, mm -hmm. get, grabbing its stranglehold on China. So I, th you know, I think the administration has to think very thoughtfully about how they manage that perception because it's going to be out there and the Chinese will be, those who are so inclined in the Chinese system will be grabbing onto that to, to make their case. And, and will Chinese leaders be uh, wanting him to stop there? Oh, of course. Pushing yeah. hard. I mean, their view is, their view is we, owe, we owe them two. You know, we owe them a sunny lands exchange and then also the, the mm -hmm. state visit from, from 2009. So. Uh, or rather from Hu Jintao's visit here when he was state president. So definitely they would want to see that happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I said uh, C, and that was more of a hopeful C, <laughs> that there'll be progress on, on TPP. Is we all know that these, these sort of summit uh, visits by the president become action-forcing events. They, they give bureaucracies and negotiators something to work towards in terms of providing a deliverable for the president when they go to Asia, and there's no bigger deliverable here, I think, than uh, um, uh, finishing the, the agreement on TPP. So I'm hopeful in that sense. Um, um, 
The other thing that I, and I know this is a panel about security, but the other thing that I would just throw on in addition to the trade issue that um, I think we have to think about going forward is um, the stuff that's happening with, I mean, it's sort of the implications, the ripple effects of the taper here because, you know, we're seeing it uh, obviously in places like um, Turkey and Argentina. And I think there's a lot of discussion, concern, <coughs> emergency meetings behind closed doors in Asia about whether this thing is going to start um, eking into Asian markets. We've already seen it cause some drop in Asian markets. Um, and I, and I, so I think that's a very real issue. Mm -hmm. And I think right now many of the countries in the region have their head in the sand. They don't really want to respond to it. Everybody's thankful for the Lunar New Year so that markets are closed until Monday and hope that it'll all go away when they come back next week. But, um, you know, for one, the taper's not going away, and I think there's an effect that could be, um, you know, that could have a real impact on the region as, you know, the president gears up for going there in the spring. Mm -hmm. I, I also said C because Victor wore a pink tie and I have one on. So, uh, <laughs> no, but I, I think the... Uh, Again, and I would agree on the hopeful C. Uh, I think that um, one, one thing this town hasn't done well in the discussion about TPP, uh, particularly on the Hill, is talked about how, how absolutely fundamental an economic policy, uh, trade policy, is to our security discussion with Asia. You know, you can't separate the two in Asia. And I, th I think, you know, if you look at the TPP debate around town, it sounds like this is about, um, it's you know just about jobs or something like that. It is about jobs, I think that's right. It is about economic renewal. It is about the Americans being part of uh, a structure or rules that will integrate Asia's economies. That's already happening. It's gonna happen with or without us. If we don't be, if we're not part of that, I think it's a problem, but, but on economic engagement, the president has to have his trip, uh, and we should say two trips, right? So Chris, I think you were talking about April when you said he wasn't going to China. Right. He actually is going to uh, Asia, it, to China, um, and Myanmar at least in November or October. I guess it could be October now, um, as they're playing with the dates. But uh, one thing we should also say, I think, because all of us, the, the, the Asia team at CSIS, um, was really jumping up and down about the president missing his trip in November. And one thing we all recommended was, you know, you've got to go out of cycle. And you know what? He's doing it. So we, I think we should really give the White House and the President credit, you know. Mm -hmm. He better go. <laughs> uh, <laughs> if he goes, we're going to give him credit. But I think that that April trip is important. But I think he can't afford to play small ball. You know, he can't go and have this trip be sort of a makeup for not going in November and just pop into Malaysia, which no U.S. president has been to since Lyndon Johnson, by the way, and, and visit the Philippines where there's very real uh, security issues. Hopefully he'll be able to anoint a new agreement on the um, access to bases uh, negotiation in the Philippines. And then Japan, of course, uh, we've got the, the very big issues uh, at stake. I think he's got, to, um, he's got to elevate his game. He's got to have something in his pocket, hopefully a, a negotiated TPP agreement that he can then use his trip as a, as a fulcrum to really start to spend that, up, uh, that political capital uh, and drive home uh, the, the security link, the geostrategic link to trade um, on Capitol Hill. All right. Um, are there, is there microphones or how do we? Um, we have a question right here. Uh, <clears throat> and please identify yourself and your organization. Hi, I'm, I'm Donna Wells, I'm independent. Um, can you talk about current levels as well as future trends and rates of popular internet access in the region? Interesting. Let's start with China on that one. <laughs> well, uh, the, the rate of increase is through the roof in, in terms of the number of people on the internet in China. Uh, I, as I tried to mention during the earlier remarks, um, there's an unbelievable tightness, obviously, that we're all familiar with, and I think that's only going to continue. Uh, it can be very painful sometimes to, to plow one's way through uh, the pages of People's Daily and so on. There's, there's uh, often a, a lot of tough slogging there. But if you read the articles that have been put out there by very authoritative people in the system, especially from the propaganda side, uh, 
it's abundantly clear they see this as a war. They talk of it in terms of warfare. And that's, I think, uh, not by mistake or by hyperbole. They, they see it that way. It, uh, it being the, the, the internet. internet. The internet as a, control as a whole. Internet. Well, not just control, but just the whole package. Sure. I mean, you know, this, this very much is the center of this, uh, this sort of issue that I was discussing earlier, which is how does this Leninist stovepipe bureaucracy right atop a very dynamic society, right? You know, that's a, that's a big, big deal. And the internet is the war zone um, for that very issue. And I think if you look at the messaging from the leadership, especially the way the so-called big Vs have been, you know, uh, paraded out uh, on CCTV to admit their errors and, and so on. I mean, it, it has a cultural revolution feel to it. It really does. Um, and I can assure you that it has not only terrified those kind of people, but even big players in the Chinese system, in the uh, internet world, you know, the Baidus of the world and so on, they're, they're being very, very careful. And it's another thing to watch, too, that's very interesting and in how the anti-corruption campaign is being used to target people in that space. So this is a full out, very well thought out strategy, and I see no sign that it will abate anytime soon. Um, South Korea, the most wired country in the world in terms of internet usage and cell phone usage per household. Enough said. Um, <laughs> North Korea, I mean, the most interesting thing, statistic to me about North Korea these days is not sort of, uh, you know, about their nuclear weapons or their 1.1 million man army. It's the, um, um, it's sort of internet usage and cell phone usage in North Korea because that's the one thing that's changing in the whole North Korea situation. Um, cell phone subscribers are now over 2 million in North Korea, which is not large by comparison to other countries. Uh, but um, it allows society to connect in a way that they haven't connected before. People can text each other the price of rice in different markets, um, which is, you know, and if the government's primary hold on the country has been the control of information, this is a brand new variable that's being introduced and has, has garnered a lot of interest. I'd just say quickly in Southeast Asia, you know, uh, also internet usage is, is way up, but there's a, there's sort of a, there's sort of an irony, right? Because the, well, well, there are digital champions now all over Southeast Asia where entrepreneurs are doing things they've never done before. Policy entrepreneurism is happening in terms of uh, a greater commentariat on policies. Uh, but it's also, um, it's also escalating conflicts uh, that w always existed between uh, religions and ethnicities. Uh, so, you know, debates like, you know, over the use of the word Allah in uh, in Malaysia uh, have become much bigger things because it's 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 um, you could say uh, heightened or exacerbated by access to social media and the internet. Well, I think overall Southeast Asia has used the internet and uh, access to markets and all the good parts of the internet very you know very well. Um, governments, ironically, are starting to think about whether to nationalize the internet. And um, there are moves, policy moves, to force companies to keep data inside of countries. And this, this is an absolute non-starter for IT companies, for banks. Uh, it just doesn't work that way. You can't afford to build data centers and keep or cache all the data that you're collecting um, in, in every country of the world if you want to do business in 100 countries. So uh, we're, we're in for a real debate you, on you this You think one. the Snowden revelations have made it easier for governments to try and make that case? Yeah, I think so. Um, more so maybe in Northeast mm -hmm. Asia. I don't think, uh, you know, obviously the Indonesians were, you know, deeply offended by what, you know, they've, they've sort of plugged the Australians on this but and given us a pass, but, you know, we're... Yeah. We're jointly in that category. We, we uh, published an op-ed um, just before Rodman's second trip to North Korea by Mr. Shin, the, the prisoner who escaped from Camp 14. And, and uh, it, it was one of those op-eds. It happens once in a while that uh, it got a lot of readers the first day, but then it got even more the second day and even more. And it just kind of had a life. And I jokingly said to one of my people, well, are these readers in North Korea? And actually, he said, yeah, there were four clicks from North Korea onto this piece. <laughs> Maybe it was the uncle. Uh, <clears throat> there were a lot of readers of it in China, um, which was interesting. Anyway, um, yes. Thank you very much. My name is Jean Nguyen with Voice of Vietnamese Americans. 
I'd like to come back to Mr. Bauer regarding Southeast Asia, because I think the rebalancing to Asia has the first focus in Southeast Asia, and also the TPP is aimed to be the legacy of President Obama. And you pointed out that it has everything to do with security and uh, the future. Uh, yeah. So two questions. First, it has everything to do with Vietnam, because in a way, in 1973 and 1974 and 75, the U.S. confirmed it's moving away from Asia, from Vietnam. And now coming back, I would like to ask you about the Nine Dash Line in the South China, Southeast Asia Sea. The current fishing ban and fishing restrictions and the in effect control of China in that area with the fishing um, fishermen in the area, what do you suggest the U.S. take action? Because I think the State Department has made statement, but does a statement have any weight in it? And the second part is the TPP. Where do you see Vietnam and its role in the TPP? And listening to the list of countries that uh, President should visit in April, I did not hear Vietnam. Is there anything that, any implications in it? Thank you. Thank you for the question. I think on, uh, on the South China Sea and what can the U.S. do, I thought Secretary Kerry's visit to, uh, to Vietnam was actually quite good. And uh, he underlined during that visit that um, freedom of navigation in the South China Sea, including for Vietnamese fishermen, uh, is a right. It's not something that the Chinese can, can bestow. allow. Yeah, bestow, exactly. Thank you, Chris. Um, so I think that's, that's a good position for the United States to take. I thought um, Asia is really hungry for more strong U.S. statements on these types of actions. For instance, the, the, the uh, flying the, the bombers through the ADIZ uh, when it went up, uh, I think Southeast Asia loved that. I mean, they, they quietly loved that. <laughs> uh, quietly being an important word there. Uh, and then on TPP and Vietnam, I think um, TPP, for, for Vietnam, TPP is uh, a great tool because the Vietnamese uh, have an economy that's not dissimilar, you know, obviously smaller, but not dissimilar from China. And they've got a lot of the same problems. They are addicted to, um, to sort of easy credit that went to state-owned enterprises. The state-owned enterprises were not, uh, were, didn't manage that well as we know now. <coughs> Um, but the state-owned enterprises dominate their economy. The Vietnamese know that they have to stay ahead of, uh, of China and of the neighborhood in terms of um, their economy if they want to ensure their national security. So TPP is, is excellent because it, it links them with the United States and other countries. Um, and it forces a sort of an exogenous pressures to do levels of reform that I don't think you could do politically, not within the Communist Party in, in Vietnam. So they use the bilateral trade agreement, the WTO accession, to this effect, and now TPP will take that up to a new level. It is a big ask for where the Vietnamese are now to get to that level, but it, it's, I think it's a measure of the strategic perspective of the Vietnamese that they have to play in, in something like Vietnam, even though it's almost an exercise like, and ec economically, it's almost an existential challenge for them to meet that objective. Mike. Uh, Mike Masetic, PBS Online NewsHour. One Asian tinderbox that we haven't gotten to mention yet is Thailand. Is there anything, any toolbox, any kit in the toolbox that the United States, China, or Japan can do to bring them back from the brink of what really looks like they're heading to civil war? And then what are the security implications in the neighborhood if they do start a civil war there? Ernie. Yeah, that's, that's probably me. Victor? Yeah. Uh, want that one? Um, this is tough because uh, I bet all of you, uh, or most of you know, uh, really well-educated Thais who have uh, you know, cosmopolitan views and years of experience, not only in Thailand, but in international organizations. But man, if you talk to any of them, they, uh, on, this, on their own politics, Thailand is so divided that they, everybody's, you know, has, is red or, or, or yellow or, has, or thinks that everyone else is uh, some <coughs> color. It's, very, uh, it's a very difficult 
uh, point that we find ourselves in Thailand. And I, I describe it as we are still in the center of a hurricane. So even though it's bad right now, we haven't seen the other side of this hurricane. And the other side of that storm could be very rough. Uh, I, would, I would hate to say civil war, but there are signs that the military is not one. Uh, you heard me say that again before about Myanmar, but the, if the Thai military has, doesn't stick together, uh, there's a real problem. Now, what can the United States do? Uh, or what can other partners do? Uh, that's a real question. I, I, we are going to do a, a conference here uh, at CSIS in about a month looking at uh, scenarios, on three scenarios. You know, which way will Thailand, could Thailand go? And then what are the US uh, responses? I have to say that, um, well, I don't have the answer to your question. Uh, I do think that some of the things we can do now is we should be strengthening our discussions, uh, our relations with the Thai military, which have been traditionally very good. But we need to elevate those engagements uh, to a, an entirely new level, sort of a, an urgency level that I don't think, I don't see happening. Um, and we, we need to step that up. I think um, going to Thailand, although it's hard, is important. Uh, that you don't, you don't give the Thais the sense that it's their problem, they're going to fight it out or do whatever they do, and that we'll all be back when they figure that out. I think it's important to, to get to the country and, um, and talk to the, the different parties. Um, but that's hard, because what, you know, what do you do? You know, if, you, if you meet with the wrong person, you're damned uh, by, the other, by half, the, half the country. So this is where, um, quite frankly, uh, the United States needs really seasoned Asia hands. The people that have been with Thailand for 20 or 30 years, uh, the guys like, uh, I'm thinking of uh, Rich Armitage. Uh, these are the guys that could, uh, that I would like to see the U.S. government uh, maybe deputize if they don't have them in their own ranks right now and, and send an eminent persons group into, uh, into Thailand to start having these conversations and, and try to calm, calm the parties down. Some of the most uh, interest, uh, I think an interesting take on this is my colleague Jackson Deal has written how Thailand's not the only place where you have an urban elite that thought it was for democracy uh, until the democracy turned out to have effects that it didn't expect. And I mean, you, you saw the same thing in Cairo when, when uh, you know, you have an elected government that behaves corruptly or maybe somewhat autocratically. and and then the long-time ruling middle class is kind of uh, flummoxed about how to respond. It, you know, Tur Turkey, Egypt, Thailand, and other places. I've got to say, I mean, I had a horrifying moment driving to work the other day where I was listening to NPR, and they, saw, they talked about the, um, you know, the attacks on, on police stations, and, and I, I thought, oh, sh shoot, this is... <laughs> this is... Is this about Thailand? And then I realized, this could be Thailand... Egypt yeah. or Ukraine. Ukraine, yeah. And in the end, in the end, the story was about Egypt. But for literally, for because I just turned it on at the right time for 30 seconds, I it, I didn't know if it was Thailand they were talking about, and that that's yeah. scary. Wait, we're about out of time. Do you, yeah, do you want to add? I just want to add a very brief comment. Yeah. I think um, I just would echo what Ernie said, and I think actually that challenge you laid out for our policymakers is even higher, from the fact that uh, the Chinese are way ahead. In this, in this game. They're mapping all those constituencies like they did after the toxin coup uh, very effectively. Um, and they're way ahead of us, I think, on this one. And I'm not sure that they'll be entirely helpful in working with us on that process. Well, um, I know I got material I can steal for editorials for months to come uh, from this very smart panel. And so thank you all, and thank you very much. Thank you, Fred. Thanks, Fred. Thank you. See you back here at 11 o'clock.